on this note, we'll be ushering in our panel that will be anchored by Rob. Rob, are you there? Uh, I am here. Can, Hello, Rob. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Can, can yes, I can hear you. All right, good so deal. So we're handing over to Rob now. Yeah. Rob will carry on with the panel where they'll be discussing the global the strategy for how to move um, digital citizenship forward. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Confidence, very much. A uh, good day to everyone. Thank it is so, so awesome to get to be in this environment again. Um, I was one of the first, uh, I, I was back in 2017 when the Digital Citizenship Summit uh, first came to Nigeria. I was very fortunate to get to be on the ground with you in uh, Lagos. So it is awesome to, to be back and to get to, to see many of you and to interact with some of you again. Uh, our discussion panel today is does revolve around the idea of talking about global strategy for digital citizenship in a post-COVID era. And we know that, that COVID has has uh, changed quite a bit globally, not just here where I'm at in the United States, which it certainly has. Uh, and it's you're not here to listen to, to me talk about it. We have a, a great panel of folks who we would love to hear their input as well. So let me, uh, but before we get started, I, I just want to take a second and just uh, just to kind of reiterate and, and just say that what really has been a truly dark time globally for many of us uh, in COVID has really has, has the opportunity to provide a spark um, that we need to lift up young men and women to use digital technology as a platform for good. Like now is the time to share the message more than ever about how our kids and how we can use our personal influence to be inclusive online. So inclusivity is one of the five pillars as, the, uh, as digital citizenship has evolved. Uh, being inclusive online is how do we help students lead with respect and empathy and care um, now more than ever is the time to encourage our communities to be informed consumers of the information flood that's at their fingertips. And uh, when problems arise, we want our students to be engaged um, in their communities and be a force for good in both in the physical communities and the virtual communities. And now more than ever, we want our students to prioritize uh, balance with regard to the role that technology plays in their life, both on and offline. Uh, and finally, we want students to be alert leaders. We want them to be community members and students who know how to create safely in online spaces so that everyone can flourish. And as, uh, as digital citizenship has evolved from the original nine elements, um, those five pillars, inclusivity, uh, being informed, being engaged, living in a life that's balanced, and as being alert, uh, we recognize that those five pillars will move us into the future. But what does that post-COVID future look like for digital citizenship? And that's what we wanna do. I just want to just want to introduce quickly. Uh, we have some panelists uh, just to give you some of their credentials real quick, and uh, and just to let you know what we'll do is we'll actually go in this order. So I have some questions I would love to ask, and uh, if we can just go in this in this order. Uh, and if you feel moved to answer this th this question, um, then please just take a, a minute to to share your thoughts. And and, and just to I don't know that we're going to come to any concrete answers today. Um, we will not come to a full solution. But the goal for today is to hopefully help everyone uh, know what are the topics, what are the ideas, what are the passion areas that we need to do more research on um, to help move the, the cause for digital citizenship to create that movement in our communities. So, so with that, I would like to take an opportunity to introduce our, our first panelist, uh, Dr. I. Addison Zhang. Uh, it's the founder of Classroom Without Walls, which is an alternative school to future-proof the next generation. Uh, Dr. I is also an Adobe Insider. Uh, an Adobe Education Leader, a HubSpot Acad uh, Academy Instructor. Uh, and as a thought leader in online education, Dr. I specializes in incorporating social media and creative technologies into the traditional curriculum to enhance student engagement and acquire 21st century skills. Uh, Dr. I's work has been featured in Forbes, uh, Inside Higher Education, Pearson Education, uh, Entrepreneur, uh, she's also, uh, so, and has also been on the Today Show and, and many others. So we look forward to hearing from, uh, from I. Also on our panel is Cynthia Merrill. Uh, Cynthia is a consultant speaker and a teacher dedicated to strengthening literacy experiences for all students. She works in diverse school communities throughout the US, coaching and training and encouraging administrators and teachers in their practices. Uh, Cynthia is passionate about creating authentic opportunities for students uh, to document their thinking using technology tools. Uh, she's the creator of the Selfie Center, a powerful help uh, a powerful help uh, constructing using video creation as a reflective tool. 
Uh, Cynthia is also a proud advisor, board member of uh, Eduro Learning, a global team of educators passionate about transforming learning using technology tools to, to lift instructional practice. Um, she's also the director of, edu of the Educator Network for Digital Citizenship Institute and advisor for the student-led organization, hashtag I can help. Um, she's also the co-author of Sparking Change, uh, Making Your Mark on Digital World. So, so we're excited to have, excited to have uh, uh, Cynthia with us. Uh, Suyan Monier is a lawyer, mediator, and uh, safety uh, e-safety consultant. Uh, she's the co-founder of Wise and Harmless, uh, part of the LAPT Foundation uh, and the Children's Internet Safety. And as an organization, they help children stay safe, smart, and savvy in their use of technology while equipping parents, which I think is something that we heard a lot about today, um, and equipping parents and educators to raise good digital citizens uh, in this digital age. Digital age. Uh, Suye has uh, co-authored two books, The Internet is Flat and Keeping Children Safe Online. She has, she has a passion to ensure that every child stays safe online and is responsible with the use of media and technology. Uh, she's also co-led the project Open Eyes, under which she participated in the conduct of Nigeria's most elaborate survey on the use of internet and digital, digital devices. So we're, we're so glad to have Suye with us. Um, Jeff Olohu. Uh, is uh, he's joining us today and he is a lawyer. He also does work with human resources. He's an educator and peace activist. He's the head of, of engagements at Kids Without a Box, which is an educational technology startup fostering digital literacy in schools. Uh, and he thrives on building capacity and consolidating gains. So we're excited to have Jeff with us. Um, uh, Dr. Kemi, Kemi Olorune Ola. Uh, She's an ed in, uh, educational technology consultant, speaker, and trainer. Uh, Kimmy is the founder of uh, Exquitech Education Technology, uh, an education, uh, an ed tech consultancy, and, uh, and a Microsoft Global Training Partner. Um, she led her team to win the Global Microsoft Training Partner Award in 2020 uh, for their contribution towards the education sector in Nigeria and beyond. Uh, Kimmy is an associate of the Digital Citizenship Institute and leads, leads the DigiCit Guards. Uh, it's a team of educators who are passionate about the care and well being and safety of students in digital spaces. Uh, and they've reached thousands of students with this DigiCit message. So we're excited to have, have Kemi, Kemi be with us. Um, so, uh, so thank you for, for, for Kemi being here. And uh, Juania Tamez, Juania Tamez, uh, so excited to have her especially with the work that she's done in Mexico, uh, for Digit Mexico. Uh, Juania is a mother of three teenage girls. Uh, she's passionate about educational technology and digital citizenship. Um, she's the founder of Edutech, social media, uh, the founder of Edutech. Um, she's a social media manager, a consultant, an advisor in the implementation of educational technology and digital citizenship in different educational institutions. Um, as the organizer, of uh, DigiCit Mexico, uh, which is held in October of 2017. Um, so she's had that she's had that moniker and uh, work there. She's been a researcher and a writer. She uh, works with collaborations both in English and Spanish with translating uh, with different print and electronic materials on topics engaging around technology, education, and digital citizenship. Uh, she is the the, D the digital C digital citizenship institute director for Latin America. Um, so we're so excited uh, to have her with us today. So I, again, in, in that order, we'll we'll have each of you unmute your mics and uh, and kind of address the questions. Uh, if if there's a question that you aren't overly passionate about and you just want to kind of go go forward, that that's okay. Um, but if there's a question that you're especially passionate about, we'd love to have you chime in. Uh, but like I said, we will go in order to kind of help help uh, help go there. So uh, one of the first questions we want to want to address when we start talking about. Um, uh, what does digital citizenship look like in a post-COVID era? Is uh, in, in in what ways, in what ways has COVID nineteen transformed the proactive digital citizenship landscape? So, uh, so I, how do you, why don't you go first? Uh, what do you think about that question? As learning, uh, so how how has COVID nineteen transformed the proactive digital citizenship landscape? Uh, in, in your thoughts. Oh, yes. Hey, Bob. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the great introduction. Thank you so much, everyone. Really honored to be here. So COVID, I, I think with COVID and everything's happening online, I think all of a sudden people are saying, oh, my God, 
this is really important. I think this message can be interpreted on quite a few different layers. I think for educators, there is this uh, like pressure or responsibility that I feel strongly that we need more educators who actually understand social media and technology and who are tech and social media savvy so that we can empower the next generation. Oh, and I feel awesome. like we don't have enough educators who are... Is that me or... I feel like we don't have enough educators who are tech and digitally savvy. And uh, like another thing is like more pressure and more responsibility also on the students. And uh, I have been teaching social media for quite a few years, like uh, almost a decade and using this myself. And one trend that I notice among our students is even though we call them digital natives, right? Very few of them are actually using technology and social media to create. Most of them are using technology and social media to be entertained, to socialize purely, you know, socializing with their friends, to be entertained, to consume. And I think that is where there are so many issues, you know, when you like, I think recently there's a documentary, uh, you hear the mainstream discourse that social media is the root or technology is the root of all evil. And uh, I, I think that is only part of the narrative and the narrative that I'm passionate about to spreading is that it depends on how we're using it, right? And uh, I, I think we need, even now with this COVID, you know, more teachers and students need to understand that we can use this powerful technology to create, to inspire, to educate, to start a social movement. So I hope to see more of the latter to use this to create as opposed to be like a victim mentality, right? Like social media is controlling us, but instead we are using this to serve us. So those are some of the changes that I noticed. Thank you. I certainly a creative approach. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, how about you? So in what ways has the COVID-19 transformed uh, the proactive digital citizenship landscape? So hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here and part of this panel um, of esteemed people, experts really thinking deeply about these topics. I want to say that um, to build on what I just shared, I think one of the most important things about this landscape that that COVID has actually kind of uh, brought into the forefront is the idea that students can actually lead us if we let them. And I, I believe that most teachers and administrators in schools operate off of a fear-based model when it comes to platforms for students. And because students often are on these platforms to be entertained, they don't know the power of connecting to audience. I always share with teachers and administrators that I work with that these platforms are actually an opportunity for us to understand the world. They're actually opportunities for us to understand what audience means. So when I'm creating something, even a small post that has a picture, there's reaction, right? There's likes, there's comments. Um, and what fuels that? That can fuel the creativity for students. I think COVID has really helped us in this narrative. and. One of the things I worry the most about is that we'll sort of stay in this um, globally, we'll stay in this kind of stunned arena of what has happened with technology and with COVID because we've been like emergency teaching using technology. My biggest um, hope is that we begin to understand the power of the tech, actually the thinking, the meta, that happens when we're using technology with kids and we explicitly teach the types of things that happen um, in our brains, right? Cognitively, when we're thinking about supporting students. And that can happen when we listen to students and watch what they're creating and what drives them on the platforms. We have to be open to that. Uh, I think COVID has allowed us to have that opportunity I think we just need to really construct some explicit ways for that dialogue to happen within school communities globally. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Suye? Thank you very much and thank you also, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for this opportunity. So I'll just, um, I took some notes down. So there are two ways essentially the two points that I'd like to focus on in the fact that 
the need has increased and then the, the supply of digital citizenship training has also been hampered. The need has increased because we have more children online. So making use of the internet and, um, in, and being connected basically more digital access since COVID. And then the trainings that used to happen usually were face to face. Mm. So especially for children, because it, it was involved in the school activities, but since schools were shot and you know there was a focus on education as a whole, we haven't been able to have as many trainings as we would have where we went physically to the schools or or different institutions that brought the children together. So. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff. All right. Hey, Jeff, are you on with us? Let's see if we can see if he's in. All right, we'll, we'll come back. I'll come back to, to Jeff. Uh, Kemi, how about you? How do you see this uh, the landscape changing? Okay, so um, I, the landscape change has um, required a new set of expectations, both for the teachers and the, and the students, and especially um, now that we are, especially in, in Nigeria here, we see a lot of schools or students now spending time acquiring these digital devices and um, spending time on these uh, devices as against pre-COVID. And so the, there's uh, a new set of expectations for what we should be doing or what we should know about digital citizenship and what we should be doing about um, this digital citizenship. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, next up, who are you? Oh, hi. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, Digit Nigeria, for having me here. I'm really, really excited to be part of this panel. And uh, I agree with all my, my panel uh, members. And uh, just to add something, uh, COVID, I think that COVID-19 uh, makes us everyone go mobile or go uh, on an online uh, environment. So. If we went on an online environment, then everything came to to an online environment that we mean uh, home, life, uh, social social um, interaction, everything went on mobile. So we need us uh, educators and both as parents to plan the, our education and where we are going to focus on in the future according accordingly to this environment that we are living on now. So digital citizenship has to be part of this educational plan and this um, part of this movement that we are going through and that we are going to keep moving forward, digital citizenship has to be involved in all our activities and all our environments that we are moving on uh, since COVID-19. Thank you, Quenia. Um, uh, Jeff, are you, are you able to un unmute and want to share your response to how COVID-19 is changing the landscape of digital citizenship? I heard something. Give him, give him one more, one more try. Be with you. All right. Well, we're gonna try to see if we can catch catch Jeff back in um, uh, as as time goes on. Uh, if you're if you're able to pop back in, <clears throat> one of the things we heard. Uh, oh, you're here. Good. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, please. All right, so um, thank you for having me. Uh, I say hello to everyone and to my uh, fellow panelists. Okay, so uh, yes, digital citizenship. I want to look at it from the perspective that it's always been with us. Technology has always been the driver of proactiveness. And to shy away from that is to be plain self-deceit. All right, so. Um, was it at any time, was there at any time that we could say that uh, uh, um, technology was not here to stay? I don't think so. What I think and what I believe strongly is that we have been able to delay the timing of the essentiality of technology. And that's why right now for us to talk about digital citizenship and the proactive approach, 
is for me even belated. COVID only came to tell us why we could not do without it. So to, for, for, for us to, to be at a point where we are saying that, oh, why do we need to? It's like us um, still being two steps behind. So yes, I, I, I look forward to the discourse um, this evening. And I, I believe that eventually we are all going to, we may not have all the answers, but we will be able to uh, come together with a set of quotes, a, a set of thoughts and research topics that would better um, the movement. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. I was glad you were finally able to, to hop in. Um, the, the next question I want us to consider um, with regard to, to how COVID has, has changed the, potentially has changed uh, the digital citizenship landscape uh, globally, is the idea that well, I think the one thing that COVID has, uh, the pandemic has highlighted for many of us is the divide between those who have access to digital technology tools and those who do not. And it, it is certainly difficult to be inclusive um, with her digital technology of everyone, one of our, that's one of the DIPSIT pillars. Uh, it's, it's difficult to be inclusive when not everyone can participate. Um, in, the, in the recent UNESCO report on education of post-COVID world that was uh, brought up earlier, it said that only 11% of learners in sub-Saharan Africa have a household computer and only 18% have household internet. And that's compared to the 50% of learners globally who have computers in the home and 57% who have access to the internet. So already we see the disruption brought on by the, pack, by the pandemic and how it's kind of exacerbated inequalities both within our countries and other countries, especially in Nigeria. What are the roles and responsibilities of communities moving forward to help address the access divide uh, in our communities? Um, I'll tell you what, Je Jeff, we'll start with you. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of go, uh, we'll go backwards if it's okay. Hey, Jeff, I don't know that I'm able to, I'm able to hear you. Is everybody else able to hear? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, they can hear you. Yeah, you're good. Thank you. So I said, in order for me not to sound, to move up. This is from the next report as a, a step even behind. The reason is this. Um, in my company, for instance, uh, we work with K-12 schools at your primary and you know, the secondary schools. And we discovered that when you talk about learners who do not have access to technology, we discover that most of these figures are make-believe. Why did I say that? A lot of them have this technology in their houses, but they do not bring them into the classroom. Why? Because some schools are set up in a way to reject everything that seems to be forward thinking. So, I said, I too optimistic. so is it to say that those devices do not exist? Uh, or, or is it to say that the technology is not available? It is available, but it is the use that should not be in question, not the availability. That's why I said I don't want to be too optimistic in my own perspective, but from what I've seen. Because we need to be realistic in our discussions today. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to be very important for the movement moving forward. So we need to be very realistic, we need to be very, very uh, 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 open-minded. All right. So for me, uh, um, uh, uh, like I said before, it's not about the lack of the technology or the tools. It's about the structure in place. All right. Like the, the earlier speakers mentioned. For some parents, it is a taboo for their children to have technology at a certain age. Now, COVID came and it became a fool's paradise to do that because you specifically should change your children. Now, the schools have been segmented. The resumption times have been broken. Into, so they have sessions and afternoon sessions in schools now. So what some of those parents have done is simply to retrieve those gadgets from the kids. So I ask a question, when those gadgets are not there in the school, does it mean they are not available in the house? So I think for us, it means that we need to move the message. Like 
Other speakers have said everybody needs to be on board. All right? It's not enough to say it's education, it's not enough to say it's business, and it's neither enough to say it's government. It's everybody. It has to be a top to bottom, a bottom to top approach. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Huenia, how, how about you? Uh, regarding regarding uh, the divide of access that we are, that we're potentially seeing. Yeah, um, in Mexico, we we had that issue um, very, uh, in a big way uh, in different communities because we have uh, different perspectives on on education. There are schools that are a hundred percent connected, and there are schools that are zero percent connected. So we need to close this gap, right? Uh, I think that in many countries it's, it's the same uh, issue of, of connectivity and, and all this. So what we need to, to do is to make some approach from different perspectives from government to, um, how do you say, empresas, ah, I forgot the word, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I said it in Spanish, but uh, uh, people from, from, from uh, individuals that have uh, a more power on our communities to, to make them inclusive and to make them change their, their perspective that not all schools are equally uh, connected. So if we have some, some influential um, teachers and influential government perspectives and we can go there like making these uh, events about digital citizenship summits and, and make them feel that we need to be inclusive with all these uh, schools that are not the same as, as the top schools that I mentioned before. If we, need, if we tell them to be inclusive, if we do this kind of events to, to change their perspective, I think that we can make a change. And especially because um, during this pandemic, what we need to do is to have like um, another way of, of seeing things that even if we are like a connected uh, country, not everyone is the same. So we need to help students to uh, go with empathy to respect and care for others. So these kind of events, they change our perspective globally. Thank you. Uh, Kemi. Okay. Um for the, what can the community do? The truth is even um, in Nigeria here, we still do have that digital divide and it's wide. And so we can easily say oh, for most households in the urban areas, um, at least the parents or two or both parents would have a mobile device. But then I work remotely from home and I need to use my, my device. And the, the dad works remotely from home and needs to use their device. And then you have four kids who need to share a device if, even available at all, that is still a challenge when schools <coughs> had to migrate. So we, I, I especially during this period, even when uh, uh, for the teachers, we found that there was really still that gap because um, there was a training we did uh, for a, a statewide training and we saw that quite a number of teachers, as a matter of fact, almost 70% of them or more didn't have access to a laptop. And so we had to modify the training to ensure that those who had mobile devices at least could fully part participate. And, but we still had some limitations when we were doing some applications. So it, it, it exists. But what I've seen some communities do, especially for children in rural places where they couldn't have access to technology, so that they wouldn't be totally shut off. We've seen what, what we call community centers, community um, tech spaces, community viewing centers. And because we have um, um, the, the government or the state roll out um, TV programs and all that, to continue, uh, keep continuity in the learning for the kids. And so for, even some homes don't even have TVs. And so it, it's, it, so you, we do have that device. So we had community centers, I saw community centers where um, at, at, at class streaming time, and the kids in that locality can visit those centers and engage with the technology that is there. So at least though they don't own it, they have access. So ownership may not be um, as much as we imagine, but then, um, there has been a way, many, uh, multiple ways where access was a bit breached, but we still know that some people are left up. Then we have we had peer support, and so I'm a kid who has access. I was able to access uh, have access to technology. I could have my friends over and all that, and we could do the learning together and all that. So we've seen all that come to play um, during this period. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, so yeah. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with the panelists so far. So what we have here in Nigeria is we have less government participation as we would have in other countries. So that also affects the digital divide. But like the question states, what would civil society organizations do? They could actually partner with governments to have maybe perhaps like regional um, frameworks for digital citizenship in specific areas so starting at the local level in order to influence things uh, uh, nationwide and then globally, of course, because there is no global strategy for um, children online as we do in the same way that we have the Convention of the Rights of the Child. But there are values, as Ms. Charity Bartone talked about, that we want to instill in children online. We want them to be kind. We want them to use um, the internet responsibly. So even as they've been educated online we want them to also learn to create and use the the citizenship as they would in the world online in a way that benefits themselves and everyone so this is the civil society does have a, a big role to play i know in in nigeria there are many civil society organizations and a platform such as this has brought and you know even unintentionally these are where the discussions that help us move forward are at birth. And then in Africa in general, we have um, Child Online Africa, and they've been doing a lot of work in that area as well, trying to have policy frameworks that they could you know, partner with governments to implement so that we're, we're promoting digital citizenship and making sure that children are not just growing um, in digital literacy, but also in the citizenship aspect. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Cynthia, how about you? Yes, thank you. I think um, building off of some of the um, panelists' thoughts and also uh, listening to Charity speak earlier about values, I think maybe COVID is also this opportunity to reboot our equity conversations around technology. And suddenly here in the States, I think one of the things that's happened um, is that suddenly there there is funds for more technology. Um, the shift from the spring to the fall, uh, where everybody was sort of emergency teaching in the spring and now in the fall, um, there seems to be a shifting of funding, right? If, if children aren't in school, we're not heating schools. I live in the Boston area, so we're not heating the schools. Um, there, there's a shifting of funds. And I think people have begun to reboot the conversation and get a little bit more creative. I, I do want to say, though, that one thing that is concerning to me about equity is, and perhaps, you know, maybe some of the panelists can, um, you know, add what happens in Nigeria. There's a big disparity between private schools and public schools around the equity conversation. And with COVID, what's happened is most private schools are face-to-face. -face. They went full on and are face-to-face -face having, having classes. Public schools are a little bit more hesitant to do that here. And so there becomes a bigger divide with who's getting face-to-face -face, um, you know, education and are they using tech anymore when that's happening? Not a lot. Um, and then we have kids who are remote, who are fully tech, um, who may not have the best devices to make that happen. So I, I do hope, I guess I'm hopeful in this question that I want us to reboot and be really thoughtful and have that as Charity was sharing earlier, the values, but also the stakeholders, partnerships, more, you know, just more um, conversation around partnerships with organizations and companies that can help with technology hotspots. That's happened here in the States. Um, it can happen more and not just because we're in a pandemic, but because it's good for learning for kids. Yes, yeah, Cynthia, I, I'd say I'm, I'm hearing that as well, just from all the panelists so far, especially in beginning Nigeria, the partnerships are key. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, hi. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything everyone mentioned so far. So the only thing I want to add is, so I think this uh, during a time like this, where there are so many uncertainties, uh, is where teamwork has become really important. Not just teamwork within a community, within a country, but global teamwork. Like for me, I, I host three different live streaming shows. So what that means is that it's like, the, the video version of the audio podcast. So I actually go live 
And surprisingly, I have lots of people from uh, India, from Nigeria watch my show, and quite a few of them are actually teachers. So one person recently told me that he has been applying what I was teaching and me and my guests, what, what we were teaching in our live show to his students. So I wonder if we can, you know, many people mentioned there are community centers, if we can have a tier system, right? We can have some information leaders who have access to technology information and those people can be the leaders to distribute information and resources to those community centers and where they can do face-to-face -face or like teaching. And uh, for those people who are really remote, we can even use the traditional like postal service, right? We can write everything down as an ebook, you know, a book, a menu, and then mail it, right? So I think we need more teamwork, more creative, and really tap into each, every single person's resources and talent to make this a collective effort. So uh, as, we've, as we've seen the landscape change um, because of the pandemic, uh, we've talked about access changing. Uh, there's also been the conversation that was brought up pre or earlier in the summit from different speakers talking about um, what does it look like for teachers? You know, how do we get teachers on board? So the next question I would have is what steps can educators take uh, to model and facilitate effective digital citizenship practices for their students and their communities? So now we specifically take a look at, at our teachers. What, can, what steps can they take to, to model and facilitate that effective digital citizenship with their students? Uh, and, and I will we'll kind of go backwards. I'll, I'll start with you and we'll kind of go back to our list. Yeah, I, I think teachers need to, I know like, you know, teachers don't get paid a lot. And I was a teacher myself for so many years, but I think teachers really need to feel a sense of responsibility to educate him or herself regarding social media and technology. When I was a teacher and I used to be part of the narrative, oh, you know, technology is not my thing. It's like the IT department. No, it's not the IT department. We all play a very important role in this. And now COVID is teaching us a very important lesson. And the past several months, I have coached and worked with teachers who don't even know there are breakout rooms in Zoom who are just so technology challenged. I think the time of waiting for a tech person to you know, teach you, that time is over. We need to be yeah. self-sufficient, self-directed learners, and to model such behaviors to influence our students. I think that is a very, very important, a big change that teachers need to do. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Cynthia, your thoughts? I would just love us to begin to think a little bit more deeply as educators about privacy, because all of a sudden in this Zoom room, we have the opportunity for uh, caregivers and families to hear the teaching that's happening. And it's an amazing opportunity for us to partner. Um, it, I can say from my own, I have three children, eat one in high school, one in middle school, one in elementary school. And my elementary school student is required to wear headphones so that I can't hear the teaching. And it makes me bananas because how can I partner, right? But now our classroom definition is different um, from COVID and the use of technology. So what happens in this box, you don't know what's outside of my little box that I'm in right now, but I can tell you there are other ears that can hear the fantastic stuff that can happen when we teach. So I hope that we begin, you know, as educators to really redefine the idea of being online and being an online learner and being an online teacher and think about the partnerships that can happen when caregivers eavesdrop. It can be a real opportunity for us um, to partner with them very explicitly. Um, and I hope that, I just feel like that's a different sort of perspective about privacy that we haven't really explored much um, that's become an issue again and again. Absolutely, as parents, especially as teachers, we always say that we want parents as partners. Um, so, so that's that's a fantastic way of thinking about that from a teacher's perspective. But I think it can also be a little scary because um, we're used to our little silo communities. Um, so yeah, so that's actually that's actually a different piece for some teachers. That certainly is a profound way that digital citizenship at this point impacts impacts teachers. Uh, good. Uh, uh, so yeah, what what are your thoughts? Hey, thank you very much. So I think the issue is not so much teachers as educational institutions because teachers hold a lot of knowledge themselves but in this new era where we are online more than offline teachers will need to retrain so you know they keep 
they would keep having to learn in order to be good role models for the children that they're teaching online. And uh, I also put down some points here. So just as um, the earlier speaker was talking about, having you know that knowledge of knowing how to use digital resources, teachers need to be more comfortable with being online so that they, they would be able to make their children more comfortable as well. But the thing is, children seem to be faster learners <laughs> in, in the online world right now. So teachers would also, and educational institutions in general, will need to look to the safety. So digital citizenship is really could be parallel to being a citizen of the, a country or the global a global citizen so the teachers would have to take it from that step that you know we're now having even if i have a particular subject i'm teaching i'm teaching via the online platform so i have to be comfortable as a teacher and i would have to learn how to use the technology more and i would also have to learn how to make sure that the children are kept safe as well as learning more about digital citizenship. So more than ever, it has to be an integral part of the educational system in general. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, we want to hop in. Uh, how is how is teachers, how is teachers do we uh, we help digital citizenship this age? Hey Jeff, we're, we're going to come back to you. I think he's struggling with some connectivity issues. Um, can you hear me now? Oh, Jeff. Oh, here you are. You're good. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I think there's just a, there's just a lag on my end. Uh, the network. Oh, sorry. It seems to lag a little bit. Okay, so sorry. All right. So I was no. saying that um, first of all, I would reiterate self development. And why would I do that? It's because here in Nigeria we place so much premium on the government okay the government has got to be visit us to a point i do understand that we are in a country where 250 million of their people should have better things coming from the government but the government is us too all right the government is somebody who just wants to get there and do what he wants to do and when his tenure is done it is it resumes in his backyard so we need to take self-development as very key. And in doing that, everybody needs to break the glass ceiling individually. All right. Then moving on to the, 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 the next phase of it, the, the, the phase where the children come into it. I believe, and I have always said this, that anybody will not refuse what brings value. So when you are assured, when you are guaranteed that you get value from a thing, you will not refuse it. So I think that educators, we need to reprogram ourselves in order to deliver the digital citizenship message in a manner that is valuable to the kids who will transform that message of value to their parents, who will in turn transfer the message into the government quarters. The kids are not the ones in government, it's the parents. So when we understand how the value chain moves, then we start the process and we are assured that it will keep on moving. This is not to say again that I am excusing the government. I am not. But we need to understand that the decision has to make sense. We need to deliver messages that are impactful, that are understandable, that are relatable. Let me use that word because we use it a lot in the, in the Nigerian palace. It has to be relatable. When we do that, then we'll be able to carry on, okay, and get our message where it ought to be. And then the third one, I would say this, self-drive. Self-drive is critical. Um, self drive because there will be moments when you will not feel like it. There will be moments when you will feel discouraged. It is the drive of self that will push us to that point where we need to get to. And yes, like Cynthia said, we need to bring in everybody. It doesn't always have to be teachers, the caregivers, 
the 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 the, 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 the people that are the first points, they need to also get on the perfect like, open statement. Technology was yet to say we were only in falsehood to think that we could avoid it. So for some people, like myself, it was only a matter of like we had been prophesying for some four, five years now. We have been prophesying the need to go digital. COVID only came to enforce that prophecy. That's the question. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're, I, I really believe you're right in terms of uh, a lot of the grassroots is that we're seeing. Um, that many changes, regardless of the country, really often do come grassroots up from the bottom and not always top down. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kemi. Uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, how educators can um, can help and engage with this uh, move forward. Okay. Uh, so as educators, we know that we teach not just the curriculum, we have what we call the hidden curriculum. And that also applies where the teacher citizenship is concerned. We need to, like you said, model this what, we, what we're talking about. We're talking about inclusiveness. And so how, how do we um, communicate online? How do we communicate with respect, meaningful communication and respectful communication? How do we model that to our students? You know, we, we, we're talking about being informed. We're talking about um, things like media literacy. How do we help our students critically think, you know, in, um, build the critical thinking skills where they know which information is, is credible and, and um, what contents they share or don't share, how to check for fake news and all that. So that's part of being informed. We need also to model that. We're talking about balance, you know. So if we are, if we are not as educators also balanced in our use of technology, if we are not re reflecting on um, how we use uh, our, our, our technology or our media uh, screen time and all that, and the impact it has on us, we will not be able to lead our students even to um, reflecting. Because besides their usual online social media press and communication or presence online, now added to schoolwork and all that, it, to them, we feel like, oh, I'm spending 24 seven online and we know what the issues are. So do they know, uh, or do they understand the ethical, um, digital well-being and all that? How do we also as educators help them model this for them so that they can pick also from us, not just pick at them, but walk through the process with them. So they understand exactly when we, when we, what we're talking about. And um, of course, they can see examples even in what we do and how we do what we're doing. So we have, um, it, it, uh, we have a lot of work on us as educators, as we engage with our students to actually model um, the in inclusiveness, the balance, and then um, how to be informed and how to stay alert. So how do they recognize if they have been um, cyberbullied? Because we know um, uh, with increase in online time, uh, there's also been an increase in cyberbully. How do we ident how do they identify it? How, what the, what, how should they respond? And what is the support system available to them and all that? So. We have a lot of uh, to play as models for the kids, even during this um, period. Thank you, thank you so very much, uh, Huania. Uh, your last thoughts on uh, on this idea about uh, the role of teachers in modeling and facilitating uh, digital citizenship. Yes, well, I agree with all, all my panel members, but I think just for <clears throat> wrapping up wrapping up uh, everything that they said is that uh, right now educators we need to be we are curators, we need to choose what, what apps, what uh, tools are we going to use with our students because not all students have the same autonomy level and because not all students have that the, the inclusive technology they need to, to learn, right? Because it doesn't matter that, for example, right here in Mexico, a private school has all the technology and all the, the, um, the facility to, to be online learning, but they are preschoolers and they are um, they are not at the same autonomy level as somebody in high school, but the teacher just speaks, speaks, speaks and tell them what to do. But the student is not prepared even to join the Zoom call for with the teacher and with all the with all the, the other students and to answer at the same time or has to be I think that uh, teachers need to focus also on that point uh, the autonomy level that each student has alongside with the technology that they are using because if they are not on the same autonomy level as a high school student uh, as a high school student they are not going to be able to join the the class right and um, 
the other thing that it's important for me is that uh, teachers need to have a communication channel, not only with the students, but also with parents. Uh, that's the most important thing to do, um, how to be um, in a positive communication with parents, uh, because right now parents and teachers are doing the same thing for students. The, and lastly, but not uh, least, the contents that uh, teachers are telling or that are teaching right now, they have to be with a special value because it's not only curriculum that what we are teaching, we are now at the houses of the students. So we need to prepare and to add up some digital citizenship contents to every lesson that we are teaching to prepare our students for the future. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, there are there are a handful of other questions we could address this time, but we, we only have this short time. Uh, and, and literally, we, uh, everybody who's on this panel is, is passionate about digital citizenship and is very passionate about wanting to see uh, not only students succeed, they wanna see homes thrive in a digital environment in ways that we can engage our community, in ways where teachers are comfortable, in ways where we can be impactful and really truly honestly make a difference in the world around us uh, and and i think our students are are a huge important linchpin part of how how we can help them engage um in in, in modern culture uh, in their local community as well as their global community to help solve important problems uh to to be citizens uh, not only in, in their community but to recognize the humanity of other people around them I uh, heard a lot of great things today with regards to um, how we can develop partnerships, um, how we can help make connections uh, in classrooms. The, the thing, I, I'm, truthfully, the thing I'm, I'm most excited about uh, as, as you listen to all the panelists talk is there's a really common thread. So, it no, so I know that in, if I'm in the United States, there are other people in other countries who are equally as passionate about this as, 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 as I am with, with my students. So our ability now to connect with them, to make a human connection with other people around the world is, is so important. And I'm, I'm so grateful for every single panelist who was on today and we were able to share your experience. And, uh, and even though this, like I mentioned at the start, even though this pandemic really has been dark for, for a lot of us, it really has the ability to force us into, into a, a, a proactive area where, where we now have uh, seen the, the, the importance of connecting digitally. So as we wrap up, I just want to say a huge thank you to every single one of our panelists. Um, and as you go back and listen to these recordings again, if, if, if they're made available, that, that you would share them. And, and if you have teachers in your life or people in your life in your community who, who don't understand, or don't have the awareness of it, uh, just the awareness of the importance of, of the embracing the digital citizenship community uh, around this, that, that you would use this as an opportunity to, to do this and further further the, the conversations that happened today. I, I'm fortunate, thank you for letting me, me moderate. It was great to be connected with all of you. And, and with that, uh, thank you again, and I'll turn it back over. Rob, I, before you go, Rob, it's Mary Alice, yeah. can you hear me? I just want to, to thank you, and I wanna let everyone know, I didn't mean to just like hijack and jump in here, but that this is just the beginning. Like we've just opened the, reopened the door to continue to this conversation and this like opportunity to learn side by side. And what you just said about, it doesn't really matter where we live, right? There's so many things, that human connection that, that continues to remind us that we're in this together. And so I wanted to let anybody that has joined us for the DigiSit Summit Nigeria, that we're going to continue every single speaker, every single panelist, as well as the moderator, by the way, and our host, we are going to invite for a more of a deep dive starting in January. And I just wanted everyone to know that before we get ready for our closing keynote. Um, is that this is just we've it's just the beginning and i will be reaching out to all everybody that's participated to continue to learn with us so thank what she, you what she said in <laughs> space hey, thank you everyone thank you hey, great days you finish up <laughs>